Forensic anthropology is a type of applied anthropology where we take the things that we learn in the classroom and we use them to solve problems in the real world. Forensic anthropologists use their knowledge of the human skeleton to help law enforcement agencies in identifying people whose remains have been recovered or perhaps to help determine cause of death. There are a lot of ways that forensic anthropologists go about doing their work and identifying the remains of people that they find. But one of the important aspects of forensic anthropology is looking at the various types of damage that can occur on a skeleton. And assessing these various types of damage can help us understand what has happened to the person during their lifetime, which might help us understand a little bit more who they are. Uh, it can also help us determine what their cause of death is or what has happened to their bodies after death. So an important part of doing this, uh, this type of research is assessing the various types of damage that appear on a skeleton. And we can break these down into three main categories. First, there are anti-mortem injuries, or there's anti-mortem damage. These are injuries that occurred prior to a person's death. Basically, they're injuries that you survive. Next are perimortem injuries. These are injuries that occur at or around the time of death. So they're, they're injuries that are associated with a person's cause of death. Finally, there's postmortem damage, which is any sort of damage that occurs after a person dies. And this could be damage that occurs five hours after someone dies, or five days after someone dies, or five years, or even five million years. Being able to parse each of these different types of damage is then really important for determining who this person was and what has happened to them. And if we take a look at, at this picture here, these two individuals who were found together in a grave in Italy, um, we see that they are embracing, but we also see a lot of breaks on these bones. So here's a question. What type of damage is this? Antimortem, perimortem, or postmortem? We'll come back to this at the end of the video. It's worth reviewing a little bit of bone biology here. Bones are living tissues, and they're composed of a few main elements. So first is the hydroxyapatite, which is the mineral component of our bones. It gives them their strength, gives them their structure. But bones also have collagen, and collagen provides bones flexibility, which is very important. Our bones need to be able to uh, bend and flex a little bit to resist the stresses of our everyday actions. Bones also have tons of blood vessels in them, uh, running through them, through, in through holes and out through other holes, and into these bone marrow cavities. This is also where our blood cells are produced. So bones are not dry and dusty and, and rock-like. They're actually really sort of juicy and wet. They are living dynamic tissues. And when I say dynamic, I mean that they're constantly remodeling themselves. And so I want to draw your attention to this Wolf's Law of Bone Transformation. This is the concept that bone remodels itself when loads are placed on it. Our bones have several different types of cells. Some bone cells build new bone, and some cells eat away old bone. But this is a process that's constantly going on. Old bone is destroyed and new bone is created. And Wolf's Law of Bone Transformation tells us that when we exert our muscles and they act on our bones, when we place more stress on our bones, then those bone building cells will create more bone. These bone building cells are also really important because they're what heals bones when we break them. So here we can see a few pictures of some broken bones. Um, as I said, bone continually remodels and repairs itself throughout a person's lifetime. So if you were to break your bone, uh, the first thing that happens is blood rushes to that site. Then cartilage starts to fill in and sort of uh, fill in the gaps of that break. The bone building cells will then start to heal that break surface. And eventually you get a fully... Uh, healed bone surface uh, and you can see there's just a little bit of bulging here. So breaks on bones during a person's lifetime will heal but leave almost a little scar on a bone and this is what makes it possible for us to see previous breaks in things like x-rays because there will be just a slight uh, scarring of the bone or, or build up around those sites of previous breaks. In this picture up here you can see a broken femur and I want to call your attention again to these break lines. In fresh bone, meaning living bone, wet, juicy bone, 
breaks often occur in this sort of spiral pattern. So whenever we see a spiral break like this, it means that the bone was fresh when it was broken. In this lower picture, we see two thigh bones, two femur bones from the same individual. Here's their left leg, and here is their right leg. And right here, we can see that this person suffered a pretty nasty break during their lifetime. Their femur broke. But because of the strength of the leg muscles, the two sides of the femur were essentially pulled past each other. And so this leg was not set properly, but the bone still tried to heal itself. And that's what we see. The bone has healed itself here and here. And this is obviously an injury then that this person survived. They broke their leg and they lived through it, but they would have been suffering from some pretty serious pain after that break. Uh, this leg is of several inches shorter than the other unbroken leg, and this would have caused a lot of pain. But it is a perfect example of an anti-mortem injury because it's something that this person survived. Disease can also leave indications on our bones. One example of this is a disease called parotic hyperostosis, or cribra orbitalia. And this is the effect of long-term iron deficiency, or iron anemia. Cribra orbitalia produces these small holes, first in the orbits of the eyes, and then it can also spread into the back of the skull. And this is essentially because if a person is iron deficient for long enough, the body will start to leach iron and other nutrients from the bones themselves. Now, this is a very serious medical condition, and it can indicate a few things. Uh, it can indicate that a person is malnourished and has been malnourished for a very long period of time. One place where we see this happening is in the American Southwest, especially with populations several thousand years ago. People who were extensively farming and eating corn as the main staple of their diet. Now, corn is a, a great food. It's in most of our foods that we eat today, but it doesn't have a lot of iron in it. And so if a person's diet is based exclusively on something like corn, that means they're not getting the other nutrients that they need. And that can lead to something like cribra orbitalia. We might also see this in very newly urbanized populations. So if we look at the archaeological record, we look at the skeletons of people who lived in some of the first big cities on the planet. This is often a feature that we see in their skeletons. And it may be because of malnutrition from the foods that they're eating, not getting enough nutrients there, but it also might be the effect of very, very long-term illness. And that's because when people first started congregating in large cities, often the sanitary or hygienic practices that we are used to today were not in effect. And so when it comes to things like human waste, people would just, you know, throw their waste out the doors. Um, you could end up sort of living in this environment where there's a lot of really nasty stuff around you on a daily basis, which could lead to very, very long-term diarrhea. And diarrhea is a really good way to leach nutrients out of your body. So when we see this type of disease in populations, it can tell us something important, not only about an individual's health, but about what was going on in the larger population. If a lot of people have these indicators, it tells us that health at a general level was at a pretty low state. Some other types of anti-mortem injury or damage can also be from repeated actions. So people like tennis players, uh, because they tend to use one arm more than another, the bones on that side of the body and these particular arm bones will tend to be a bit larger than the bones of the other arm. And that's again because of Wolf's Law of Bone Transformation. This is the arm that's doing all of the work, so the muscles are building up. And the bigger the muscle, the larger the bone needs to be to attach to it. Uh, so we can look at differences in a person's bones from you know, one arm to the other and see that that person has been involved in the same activity over and over and over again. And repeated stresses on that bone cause it to build up a little bit larger. The same thing can be seen um, in... Again, these southwestern American populations where people were really dependent on corn. This corn was ground up uh, to use as sort of maize meal for flatbreads. 
But the grinding of corn is something that would have taken a long time. It's estimated that a woman would have to grind corn for approximately five hours a day to be able to feed her family. And this is the position that a woman would sit in, on her knees with her feet tucked underneath her. The stress is placed on these various parts of the leg, then resulted in extra bone growth at those points of stress. So we can look at women's knees and women's ankles to determine the types of activities they were doing on a daily basis. There are also cultural modifications that have happened all over the world and all through time that affect uh, how skeletons look. But again, these are all anti-mortem changes. So one example of this is skull deformation, and this is a worldwide phenomenon. We see it in Peru, we see it in parts of Africa, we see it in the South Pacific, where people have intentionally shaped the skulls of babies to conform to some sort of cultural ideal. So this is about beauty or status. And here we see a young baby whose head has been wrapped in fabric to initiate growth of the skull in this upward direction. And it's pretty easy to manipulate baby skulls in this way. Another type of cultural modification is foot binding, which is now illegal but was practiced um, for a very long time in China. And in this practice, a woman's feet were bound, uh, sort of crumpling them up bringing these, you know, foot bones that would be right here, bringing those up a bit more here, you can see it a bit in an x-ray, um, essentially folding the toes underneath the first, the uh, larger part of the foot to be able to fit into a very tiny shoe like this. Uh, this would be a very uh, painful modification, but it was meant to indicate that the woman was high status enough that she didn't need to be on her feet, she didn't need to be walking around. So this is a sign of beauty, it's a sign of wealth, and it's a sign of status. Corseting is another example that we have in Europe and in America. This was very common during the Victorian era. And in corseting, there's simply fabric uh, with some sort of boning that's wrapped around the torso to pull into a very, very tight waist. And this is something that we don't see obviously as often anymore, but there are some women who still practice this today, and this woman has, I believe, about a 13 or 14 inch waist. And you can see this would obviously have an effect on her skeleton as her ribs are pulled in and then other, other organs are sort of pushed down and around. Teeth filing is something we might also notice. Again, this is a worldwide phenomenon. We see it in parts of Southeast Asia, we see it in Africa, where a person's teeth are intentionally filed down to create these points. Uh, this is a sign of beauty in many places. Uh, it can also be a sign of sort of fierceness. And here's a picture of a young man named Oda Benga. And this man has a very interesting backstory. Uh, he was brought to the United States from Africa in the early 1900s. And if you want to do some more reading about him, there's a lot of information on the internet. Uh, but he actually has close ties to the Bronx Zoo. At the time that he was brought to the United States, he was displayed very much like an animal in a zoo for people to come and to gawk and to see, you know, primitive humans of the world. Uh, and it's actually quite a sad story. But we see in him these uh, pointed teeth that have been filed down, and that was certainly part of the appeal for Americans who would come to, to gawk at him. Our last form of anti-mortem modification is something called trepanation. And this is a fascinating, um, a fascinating practice that people have been doing for almost 10,000 years. Trepanation is when a person has a hole intentionally drilled in their skull. So again, some of the earliest forms of this we see almost 10,000 years ago, uh, but people were still practicing trepanation up until, you know, 200 years ago. This was often seen as a way of releasing evil spirits in the brain or, you know, letting out dark forces. It probably, if we want to look for a medical reason for it, it probably more likely has to do with releasing pressure on the brain. And this is actually something that 
surgeons will still do today. If someone has a brain injury and the brain starts to swell, this can be very dangerous. And so neurosurgeons will sometimes put small holes into the skull to release that pressure. And we can imagine the same thing was going on in the past. If someone had a brain injury or was troubled by extreme headaches or migraines for very long periods of time, then holes might be drilled in their skulls to relieve that pressure. And we know that these are anti-mortem uh, modifications because we can see how they heal. You can see on this particular scar here that the bone has started to heal and this hole right here has also started to heal. So trepanation is a practice that people survive. Next we come to our perimortem injuries, the injuries that occur at or around the time of death. So these are injuries that typically are somehow a part of how someone has died. And the way that we distinguish perimortem injuries is basically we look for those breaks with, again, this spiraling sort of fracture surface, which indicates that the bone was fresh or the bone was living when it was broken, except we don't see any evidence of healing. So perimortem injuries are just the things that happen to your skeleton that you don't get a chance to heal because you're dead. Uh, same thing up here. Some of these injuries might very well be perimortem injuries because they were traumatic enough to cause death and the person didn't get a chance to recover from them. Finally, we come to postmortem damage. And this is anything that has happened to a skeleton after death. Like I said, it could be, you know, five hours after death, five years after death, or 5,000 years after death. And there are many ways that skeletons can become damaged. One of those ways might be through just basic breakdown. Uh, you know, if a person is buried and their grave is then crushed, then that could break the bones. In post-mortem damage, we tend to see these very characteristic blunt breaks. So rather than the nice spiral breaks that we see on living bone, when bone is dried out and then breaks, it becomes this almost perpendicular break surface. We sometimes also see that animals like to gnaw on bones, especially rodents. Uh, here you see some gnaw marks, and this would have been from some little, you know, mouse or something that got into this person's grave and chewed on their bones. So it's typical uh, to see modifications from other animals getting into graves. If a skeleton is left out, you know, laying out on a surface somewhere, then just general weathering from sunlight, from wind, from water, that can break bones down. But there's also some cultural modifications that we can see. And this picture is quite interesting. Uh, this is a picture of a woman's skull from the 1200s from Eastern Europe. What you see here is a brick that has been put in this woman's mouth. And the brick was put here after she died. Now the 1200s in Europe, this is a time where people were uh, suffering from the bubonic plague. You know, the Black Death is sweeping across Europe. It's killing millions of people. This was also the time when stories of vampires were first being imagined. Except in those early days, vampires were people who spread the bubonic plague. And it was believed that a person could rise from the dead to spread bubonic plague if they chewed on their burial shrouds in their grave. So the idea was that if someone looked like they were going to become a vampire, or if you had a suspicion that after a person died they might become a vampire, then the best thing that you could do to prevent that from happening was prevent their mouths from moving and chewing at their burial uh, garments or their burial shrouds. This brick was placed in this woman's mouth after she died to prevent her from chewing on her burial shroud. So when we see something like this, this is obviously a post-mortem uh, occurrence. This is something that was put in her mouth after she died. And if this caused damage to her skull, we can understand that that is a post-mortem process. So now let's return to this picture of these two individuals, uh, a male and a female who were buried together and whose skeletons, we obviously see a lot of breaks along these skeletons. What type of damage is this? Is it anti-mortem, perimortem, or post-mortem? Well, if we look carefully at some of these breaks, even though it's not a great photograph, uh, if we consider that this half of the skull is missing, 
the best and most logical explanation for this is that it is post-mortem damage because we see a lot of blunt breaks. We see them occurring in lots of places. Um, it's unlikely that all of these damages could have been sustained in a person's lifetime. It's also unlikely that this amount of damage would occur right at the time of a person's death. These all look much more like post-mortem injuries that are probably just caused by the collapse of the grave that they were buried in. And so these are our three types of damage that can occur to a skeleton, and they're all essential for understanding who an individual was and what has happened to them during their lifetime and their death.